I, I remember one day we hiked deeper into the hills and it, it's, it's very hilly out there. We get to the top. There were like 40 to 50 people at the top of this big hill. And up there was a pretty famous monk. Uh, if you've ever heard of Thich Nhat Hanh, yep. he was there and we got to meditate with him. And Really? Yeah, it was cool. Like I, I, I met like a, like a celebrity within the Buddhist community and I had no idea. Hey, fellow workers. My name is Kim Seaver. Welcome back to the Alberta Worker Podcast. You are tuning in to episode one of season three. The Alberta Worker Podcast is a proud member of the Labor Radio Network, as well as a proud member of the Harbinger Media Network. We are broadcasting from the territory of the Nitsitapi, and I am pleased to welcome our first guest of this season, Norman Tran, who happens to be a general installation and drywall contractor. Welcome, Norman. Hey, Kim. How's it going? Good. How are you doing? Great, man. Good. Glad to have you on here. Looking forward to our conversation. You know, tell us a little bit about who Norman Tran is, where you came from, where you grew up, what your family life was like, where you went to school. Share with us your personal labor history, first job, subsequent jobs, what you're doing now, the journey you took to get there. And you can either share those separately or you can intertwine them. But the floor is yours. Okay, cool. I'm Norman Tran. I'm, I guess, a second generation immigrant. That's where you're your parents were the immigrants, right? Well, see, I would consider myself on my dad's side, third generation Canadian, because my grandpa was born in Canada. When his parents came from Germany, my dad would have been second generation and that would make me third generation Canadian. I see. So that would make my brother and I first generation Canadian if my parents came from overseas, right? That's how I'd be doing it for my family. So I think that's how it works. Sure, sure. Anyways. <laughs> My family came from overseas. They came shortly after the Vietnamese War, and they met here actually in a bakery when they were like 20, and then had my brother and I. Let's see, we grew up pretty poor. We didn't have anything in oh uh, in Edmonton, I should say, Edmonton, Alberta. My mom raised us pretty much from when I was three. It was around when my dad bailed, so it's pretty much just been us, right? It's been me, my mom, my brother, and her mom and her older brother. And so it was basically just the five of us for the longest time. I remember growing up having to translate a lot for them because they were just trying to make things work, you know, they didn't have time to right. also learn the language. Yeah. I got to see the sharp contrasts between like their expectations, their, their, their traditions, their culture, how that clashed with stuff here and the pressures put on us as, as kids to kind of make it work for them as much as possible. That makes sense. You're trying to have this allegiance to their traditions that they brought from their home country, but as well, you're trying to fit in with your friends and general society and stuff like that. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of difficult. Well, I remember being pretty resentful about it growing up, right? Like why can't we just be normal and have lots of money? And <laughs> I got to learn pretty early on that it's not always like they show it in movies and, and that, right? But she made it work. She did great. For us, I'm eternally grateful for everything she's done and everyone who supported her. We grew up, went to French immersion here all 12 years, I guess, in Catholic French schools. Did your mom already speak French? No, not at all. Was Vietnam a French colonial territory at one point? It was a French colony for quite a long time. We were from South Vietnam, which was more, more French, I would say. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because... When you said your parents left Vietnam right around the troubles, I was wondering if they were from South Vietnam. So Yeah, they are. I grew up hearing a lot of stuff about the North Vietnamese, which I never really revisited those opinions until I was like 25, right? Sure. I, I had internalized a lot of things. And there's someone in my neighborhood who flies the South Vietnam flag. I grew up being told that like our original flag, oh, we were three stripers, uh, this was our original flag. And I guess like this would be how Confederate families talked about the south you know after they lost there was that like this was the real flag and this is who we were and yeah. you know like all these jealous people came in and took our stuff but that's what's the sense <laughs> yeah i did grow up with that like let's see you're saying you french immersion yeah yeah i remember my mom threw us into lots of extracurriculars like as many as she could i realized that at the core she wanted us to have a choice which I feel like she didn't really get to have having had to help take care of her family at such a young age and take on like so much on board. And then it never really stopped for her. And so she wanted us to have a choice. And so she exposed us to all kinds of sports, all kinds of 
I guess, hobbies. Like she tried putting us in cadets and Boy Scouts. We went to a Buddhist temple for a very long time. Every Sunday was our Sunday school. That's that's where I actually learned Vietnamese. Oh. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Your mom and her family, were they Buddhist? No, she was like a thousand percent agnostic. She wanted us to okay. have an informed opinion right. when we finally decided to choose which way we would lean. Okay, I, I got to grow up, I guess, Catholic and Buddhist. I got <laughs> to see what they're both about. Right. Yeah, it was cool. But consequently, we were vegetarian like two days out of the week, every week. So ate lots of tofu growing up. <laughs> oh, interesting. Was that the Buddhist culture? Or was that the, like Catholic, no, no fish on Friday sort of thing too? It was more convenient to send us off to the temple and then we would just eat there. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. They provided only vegetarian food and you ate there for those days. It wasn't like religiously mandated on us. No, it was just convenient. My grandmother, her mother was very integrated with that temple. She spent lots of time there. So, And that's your mother's mom? Yes. Okay. She was a vegetarian from like 12 back home. So she was all about that. <laughs> is there a lot of vegetarian Vietnamese food? Like, is that a, a pretty big thing? In my experience, yes. But that's because of I didn't have much exposure to Vietnamese culture outside of the temple. Okay. Okay. That was where we went to meet other Vietnamese people. We didn't really come with like strong familial relationships. Like the, the family that did come here with us kind of went and did their own thing all of them I, I found out later that we had basically been black sheep because my mom left my dad right he couldn't stop uh cheating on her and she finally had enough but in our culture that's a stain on her is that still the case to this day yeah i'm sure like because she basically disengaged from the community and these tight communities kind of just keep talking about stuff for decades and like keep holding these opinions that don't never really get changed because they don't try to change them and so yeah. As far as they know, my mom is still like out. Yikes. Nah, it is what it is. Yeah. I got to see a lot of all sides of things growing up. Sure. We used to go on these retreats for the temple. They would send us to like other temples in the area that were just getting built or like people would own languages and we would disappear for a couple of weeks. Well, not disappear, but like we would go and I guess it was, it was like Bible camp where we would study scripture and just hang out with other kids. But one time we got to go to San Diego and I lived in, like I stayed in those mountain those hills for like three weeks. Wow. That was wild. There was like very little technology out there. It still blows my mind how picturesque it was living out there for few weeks I, I remember one day we hiked deeper into the hills and it, it's it's very hilly out there we get to the top there were like 40 to 50 people at the top of this big hill and up there was a pretty famous monk uh if you've ever heard of Tit Nhat Han, yep he was there and we got to meditate with him and really yeah it was cool like I I, I met like a like a celebrity within the Buddhist community and I had no idea you didn't know who he was at the time well I mean like I'd seen his name on books and I was just like yeah okay we just hiked like two miles out it's hot as hell and we're just gonna sit up here for another two hours but it it was cool that's cool wow yeah let's see around high school is yeah high school is when i had my first job okay i was a dishwasher at chili's oh really nice i'd actually been hired to be a host on the first day that i showed up they were down a dishwasher and they're like it's two more bucks if you hop in the dish pit. oh really oh wow I was like, I like money, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so did you ever end up hosting or you just stayed on dishwasher? No, they just shuffled me into the dish pit. <laughs> okay. My life could have forked right there if I had just been like, no, I'm not dressed for it. <laughs> my second oldest and my third oldest were both the dishwashers too uh, when they were in high school. Cool, cool. So they get it. <laughs> <laughs> that started like a, I guess, eight years career as a cook. Okay. At Chili's or somewhere else? Ah, uh, just all over. Oh. I did not really stay locked down at restaurants that long. I was probably like two months in the pit when I had a buddy there, like finally convinced them to let me start prepping for them and cooking, like helping out on the cooking stations and stuff. And I love that. I realized that I really, really, really like fire and food. <laughs> That was lots of fun. Like they started me on pans. I was still 15 and somehow they let me move to main grill, like during big dinner rushes, cooking steaks and burgers for everyone. Like just some little 15 year old who maybe should have used, <laughs> could have used more training. <laughs> 
I felt like a superstar. It was a lot of fun. I mean, my first real job was at McDonald's and I was on the deep fat fryer and I was only 15. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, looking wild. back now, that could be pretty dangerous getting a 15 year old to be in charge of all this hot oil. And it was like a big, a big long thing of deep fat fryers, for the chicken burgers, the fish burgers, the chicken nuggets, the, right. uh, the pies, the fries. You got this huge long line of vats. And it's just me managing all this thing. So, <laughs> oh my goodness. Looking back, there's a little bit of cringing sometimes, but uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I remember that. I remember nobody ever taught me how to cook a steak. So I was slicing the back of them to check the, their cookness. <laughs> <laughs> Not letting them rest, that's for sure. Oh my God. I can't believe I was doing that. It got better, I promise. <laughs> and it only happened there when I was 15. I, I have a lot of fond memories from that time. Like the cooks were great people. I remember it was very diverse in that back house. They were very comfortable people, you know, like like they, they didn't care about the accents, the the broken English. They worked through it. They joked. They had a great time. Cool. That's awesome. That's the way every workplace should be. Yeah, it was family. It was like we roughed it together. Like it truly felt like, you know, not the corporate bullshit where they, where they sure. say it's family. It, it really was family. Right. It was family among the workers. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We didn't have that. I really enjoyed that time. I started working at a like a, a fine dining joint downtown. Uh, it's not there anymore, but I went to for busing tables, running food. It was very different from cooking. I got to see the, the contrast between back of house and front of house, like actually having sure. to care about how I look. <laughs> yeah. And having to deal with the customers on what's taking so long with their food or whatever. I looked very 16. So people tended not to take their problems to me because I was just some kid oh. running food for them. Okay, well, that's good. I got, I basically just got all the, the perks of that position. That's where I got my love for pad thai. This place has the best pad thai in the world. Oh. Can't find any more because they closed. Right. From there, I went back to cooking in restaurants. Well... It was mostly like little diners and bars for a bit. There was the Elephant and Castle pub I worked at, like just outside the movie theater downtown. I was a very irresponsible kid. We would hide in the freezer and smoke. <laughs> <laughs> smoke around all the frozen food. <laughs> well, my buddy told me that like, that compressor pumped it all outside, which was a lie. Because we finished and we walked out and you could just smell it throughout the entire bar. And we were like, oh, I guess not then. <laughs> like this was after they got rid of smoking in restaurants and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember that was the exact job where I realized that like, I should probably start caring about the job I'm doing. Because like, like, I had the awareness to know that I was like pissing off the people around me by just not caring that much. Right. Not enough to like actually change my behavior. <laughs> You're still a teenager. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I started giving a fuck in that job. And it, it's honestly, it's just kind of all been downhill from there. <laughs> but no, that, that was a good time. After Elfin and Castle, I started a stint at Tony Roma's. Do they still have those in Lethbridge? Oh, I think so. They were in one location before. And have you been in Lethbridge before? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, we did have a Tony Roma's like probably 15, 20 years ago is when it opened. But then they changed locations. I've actually never eaten there. But I think it's still in this in the second location. So I think we still have a Tony Roma's. Yeah, I think we had a bunch of them shut down or leave. And I, I don't remember if they closed or like, gave up or not. Like, that started like a like a big chapter in my life, I guess. Met up uh, some people around that time that would hang around for the next 10 years. Like I moved out at 18. So that was my first independent job, I guess, like where all the responsibility was on me to make my bills every month. Like that was the first time I had to deal with that, right? You were at Tony Roma's then when you moved out? Yes. Okay. All of a sudden you need a lot more shifts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I basically lived at that restaurant for a while. Like we worked a literal block away from where we lived. So. Oh, you were living with somebody? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd moved out with my buddy who got me the cook position at Chili's. Oh, okay. Uh, him and I don't talk anymore, but that was that was at the time. Yeah. Worked there a lot. Was on my way to being made supervisor. And then this buddy, like, ended up moving to Calgary and then kind of falling off the map. 
like he got into hard drugs and stuff and his family started reaching out to me hey man we haven't heard from him in like a couple of weeks now and i was like oh that's cool like last last time i talked to him he was like saying stuff about meth so this isn't good and you know being young and dumb in 19 i was like i'm going to move to calgary and save my friend and i did that <laughs> i didn't do that last bit but i moved to calgary <laughs> yeah. are you in calgary right now no I, I lived there for a year and i'm back in edmonton now oh okay it was just a year but that year was like the year that calgary had that really big flood right it was pretty biblical. I remember that. <laughs> like all the arenas and everything. I don't know if I've just never really had like felt community before, but it, it felt like I had this really pure feeling just wanting to go out and freaking help people who were still stuck by the floods and stuff, right? Yeah. People we were staying with had like boats where we, we were like, we should take them downtown and like paddle into these buildings and help people. Yeah. <laughs> I was in full like rescuer mode or whatever. <laughs> That's cool though. Yeah, it was wild. But while I was out there, I started uh, hanging drywall with these guys. Mm. This experience would set me down the road to where I guess, where I am now. Okay. Because I, I did drywall for like a year in Calgary and I really liked it. It was different from cooking. Right. The crew sizes were a little smaller. Get away with a little more because we were just a bunch of idiots just trying to get by. Different type of work too, like a lot more physically demanding. Yes, I was skinny as a cook, and then I bulked up. <laughs> I, I was smoking at the time, too, so, like, oh, my God. I was, like, a black belt in Taekwondo, too, at this time. Oh, really? I guess drywalling came a little easier, like, in terms of managing my body. Okay. It was part of these extracurriculars that my mom would put us into as kids. Your mom was looking out for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she still is. <laughs> Mama turns a saint, as we say. <laughs> But uh, became a bit of an alcoholic too. Or like realistically, it was the people I was living with and working with. It being the same people did not help. I came back to Edmonton like a year later. I was a little disenchanted with my whole time in Calgary. I just wanted a fresh start. So I went back to the Tony Romas. <laughs> I tried to serve there. I really did. Like I came back as a server. They let me serve for like three weeks and then they're like hey man we need you in the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> you're too good of a cook we need you back there <laughs> i don't know how much you know about like the front of house back of house rivalry in kitchens like i'm sure it was three weeks serving pretty much like i released that that negativity i was just like yeah they got it bad too and it they, it, it really is as bad as they say <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was like this would work better if we just worked together right exactly and like, I truly believe everyone should do some time cooking and serving. So they're not just such big dickheads when they go for their food, right? Totally. I started working in actually nice restaurants. I did some time at Chop, the Rockford. That place is gone now. Still working grill. Still loving it. I, I got really good at cooking. I feel like not to toot my own horn, but <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I was young and I devoured any learning I could do. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> I met my my fiance at chop oh. my fiance now we are that that front of house back of house love story <laughs> this is the tale as old as time yeah except that i actually worked <laughs> yeah <laughs> we both ended up leaving that place it was very bad there she had had a blood clot in her lung at 18 oh wow yeah at first it was misdiagnosed as like pneumonia or bronchitis and so it went a little longer than it should have and she was still serving while like coughing like literally hacking her lung out oh my goodness and still serving and then like eventually it was too painful for her right they just basically stopped scheduling her right like they just kind of out the door with her that was that was very scummy of them <laughs> yeah no doubt but that's such a common story too like you know they want you to do a certain job at a certain level of production and if anything happens to you it's an inconvenience to them and they don't want to have to deal with it so they just get rid of you that's just it right yeah that's the thing that i'd slowly like come to realize just from watching but like having done some extracurricular learning since it's made it very clear to me that we're just like it's not just that we're numbers but like we're meat bags right totally yeah. Like labor means something different to them. Well, like it's, it's no different from, you know, a farmer a hundred years ago with a workhorse, right? That's, they see us the same way that farmer would see their workhorse or oxen or mule or whatever. I would think less so because that farmer might see that oxen as family, right? Yeah, maybe. 
Yeah. <laughs> they might actually mourn that that box is passing. I've seen people quit or get fired or like quote unquote not make it for things completely out of their control. Like not everyone gets to choose when like crises in their life happen and like they don't have the mental capacity to fucking work retail at that point in time, right? Yeah. Or like a chronic illness. Watching my fiance go through that really made it very clear to me how close to disability everyone is, right? I've heard people say that everybody ends up disabled in their life. It's just a matter of when. Absolutely. Yeah. That's just it. And so we should be, you would think that we'd be designing society with that in mind, right? Exactly. With an intentionality towards accommodating. When we make accommodations, it benefits everybody, not just people who are disabled. Like you just think about closed captioning. How many people watch movies and stream TV shows with closed captioning on and they don't have any hearing issues? Me. <laughs> right like my this is a closed captions household i know it's so common for people to do that and and yet it's just a simple accommodation and there are so many other things like that too like curb cuts it's useful for people in wheelchairs but it's also useful for people pushing strollers or you know shopping carts or whatever 1000 percent, we should be designing these cities for people in like every aspect of it right yeah when she had the blood clot, it started in her leg. So there was a point in time when we thought she would be losing a leg. Right. All of this came into effect too, right? Because then everywhere we went, it was just like, there's zero accommodation here. This is terrible. Like, you don't really notice these things until you have to. And it, I think that's garbage. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah. by that point, it's too late for you, person who's disabled, to do anything about it individually. Yeah, I remember... Uh... Back at the beginning of the school year, our fourth child is entering high school, grade nine, and they were having like a parent information night. They were going to do a meet and greet with the teachers afterwards. And I can't stand for long periods. And I knew that was going to be a lot of standing because it's going to be like six teachers we'd have to go to and we have to wait in line and everything. So I brought a wheelchair. It's such an old school. I think it was built in the, in the 50s or something. There's only one way to get into the gym uh, with a wheelchair. And that door was locked, the outside door from the parking. First of all, it's off of a parking lot that's available to only staff, not to the general public. So we had to park on the street and then push the, and the wheelchair I have isn't self-propelled. So my spouse has to push it. And we get to this door and it's locked and there's no, there's no way to open it. And so we're going to go back all the way around or something, figure out something else. But there happened to be a staff member who showed up late and was able to let us in. But then we get to the gym and the chairs are so packed close together. There's no space. And then we're trying to get to, down this narrow aisle to this little space off to the side where we, where is basically the audio visual booth is where we ended up putting the wheelchair. And we're trying to get down this aisle and people coming the other way as able-bodied people just walking, just trying to sneak right by me as I'm going through. <laughs> Let me get into Fucking this or just pull off to the side shit, or something. Man. It's like, oh my goodness, it's nasty. And then it was funny too, because after the presentation and we were going to the different teachers, it was really interesting seeing or most of the teachers talking to my spouse because they were eye level and just hardly talking to me at all. It was really eye opening. That's awful. Like, oh, fuck. Oh, and then on the way out, <laughs> but we thought, well, okay, well, maybe it's just, just locked coming in, but going out would be fine. I, I pressed the, there's a, one of those automatic door opening buttons and I pressed it. And uh, <laughs> nothing happened. It wouldn't open the door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> well, I had to push the door open while I'm in the wheelchair. Oh, that's awesome. That's freaking awesome. Like, it's almost like accommodations to these people. It's like just a thing on a checklist that they can check off. Like, oh, look, there's a freaking three by four space on the ground at the front of the freaking, you know, the the the, the audience. Yeah. And like the aisle, who cares about how they get there? <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. Yeah, it, it is really eye opening. Like talking and, and like speaking about people like get become invisible. Like there's like a big one that I'm on lately is like women's labor, right? Right. So much of everyday society would be literally impossible without the labor that goes on in houses. Totally which does not get fucking accounted for, right? All this invisible labor that goes on, which primarily falls in the lap of women, right? Yeah, absolutely. Just keeping everybody healthy and fed and clothed. Yeah. 
and then it wouldn't bankrupt us as a society like we know this <laughs> yeah. you know the the society that's producing more than fucking at any other point in human history and their labor isn't counted in the gdp calculations no where was i <laughs> you were talking about your fiance um having to deal with the right. blood clot in her leg and you know experiencing you know a common lack of accommodations and stuff that continued on into her time in college and got to see or i guess university got to see how they handled that too i don't really have too much to say about that that was harder on her and her deal and it really stuck in me that like in a better world we would be more accommodating for everyone right absolutely like throughout my life i've just certain lessons have lodged in me from just paying attention to how people around me have suffered like we have this tendency to look at how the best of us are doing and to just kind of like you were saying right like they wouldn't even freaking look at you <laughs> that's fucking dog shit that was funny because just a few weeks after that we went to a a rally in Lethbridge. there was a protest that was organized by anti-trans activists just going on all the stuff they want to keep you know, queer stuff out of schools and anti-soji, all this kind of stuff. And so we organized a rally in response to that. Again, because I can't stand for long periods and it sounded like it was going to be a couple hours, I brought my wheelchair along and I'm sitting in my wheelchair and I was like the guy that people were coming up to. It was like they were infantilizing me or something, right? Because I'm in a wheelchair, maybe I'm an easier target or something. Oh, I see. Yeah, it was really interesting. Interesting, hey? They just go for the most vulnerable right off the hop. When presented with, you know, people that they don't agree with or whatever, like things that ideas that are not like the cultural norm right now, the people they attack first are not like who they, they think will hold, they'll stand their ground. It's, it's always punching downwards with these folks. It's, it's mind boggling. Yeah, totally. All right. So your fiance is in university. Yes. Around this time, I, I think like I, my time in kitchens had ran out. So I went back to drywall okay on a subcontractor's crew did that for a few years and then eventually i was approached by one of the bosses like for one of these companies that we were subbing through on his job site he like he tried to hire me i, I was pretty like Ooh, that's cool right like i was a little flattered but my boss was like why why would he do that like like <laughs> you're working for me what the hell <laughs> right yeah <laughs> that was kind of scummy but i did eventually go work for this guy because his crew wasn't working out for me. It wasn't the direction I wanted in my life either, right? By this point in my life, I think I wanted more agency, more control. Okay. And I was able to negotiate that into my terms at this next position for this company that we had been contracting through. I came, I went on to work for them on their in-house service team. And so I started doing like another aspect of that job, like not the every, every other piece of drywall that gets hung up in a house that the subcontract crews don't put on. Like there's a lot of like behind the scenes work or it would be like house calls down like a year down the road for like warranty work or whatnot. I think that's the most I've worked with with customers, I guess, face to face. Well, aside from like that time I served for three weeks, but <laughs> working, I worked service for a couple of years. That was, that was nice. I got to actually be like, hey, we're here to fix the problems in your house, right? And then actually fix them because I like to be able to sleep at night, right? Biggest purchase of people's lives. Like, we should be fixing it. Sure. I, I picked up a lot of experience in that way. I got to see what happens if you take shortcuts, like the effects down the road, right? Right, yeah. Things that, you know, they don't teach you or they don't really care to teach you or like at the end of the day, it's, there's not enough money for you to take the time not just blow through things as fast as you can like that was kind of the the creed i guess for subcontractor drywall hangers borders at the time or at least it was for us because we were just one of these small crews that couldn't land like these big custom contracts or whatever right we made our money in quantity and it's sad like the rates that they were getting paid we were getting paid eight years ago now those rates haven't changed really yeah, they're still making basically the same per footage of board they put up. Oh my goodness. And that's not unique to just drywall, right? Like that's that's the construction industry. Not like people's rates are not changing. But as we all know, cost of increase has not like has like skyrocketed, right? Unless it's like like uh trades people and stuff who have unionized jobs and stuff like that. But yeah, 
general contractors and laborers and stuff wouldn't be the case. Even the service guys are making the same salary, right? Like that's, it's all aspects of construction. Obviously there are exceptions. There are people out there way better than me at this, but like mine was a very average experience in this industry, right? You're expected to work crazy hours for a shitty hourly wage. If you want any more, there is none because the guy above you is not getting any more. Right. Yeah, that's true. Union's a dirty word, right? Because you yeah. start talking union around these folk and they're just, it's all like union dues and like, oh, we don't like being told what to do or like, oh, they're just slow and lazy. And it's like, yeah, but you're saying this now, but when you talk to the old timers, they all tell you they wish that they'd been able to like take it easy so they can, you know, throw their grandkids up in the air and chase them around the yard. They can't do that. Exactly. Their bodies are wrecked, right? These are the yeah. old timers that con they all say that on the one hand, it's like, take it slow, take it easy. Like, and then on the other, it's like, what the fuck? Pick it up. Let's go. Right. <laughs> like, no, I'm listening to what you said. <laughs> yeah. With the wages too. Like part of it is some construction companies, like um, contractors, they'll hire temporary foreign workers and undocumented workers and take advantage of them and drive down wages in that regard as well. So yes. just this whole complex web of just trying to suppress wages in any way that they can and just taking advantage of all these workers because they know they're not going to do anything. The first crew that I worked on after having come back from Calgary and like when I went back into it here, like he was very much a yes man, right? And that was how he cemented his place as like always having work. But consequently, we always had shit work to do at like shit wages, right? Because this guy was terrified of trying to negotiate a better position for himself. He thought everybody else was going to outbid him or whatever. Yeah, that's just yeah. it. And we're yeah. talking pennies, right? It is a race to the bottom. It's very cutthroat. Like the solidarity, it's not really out there. Of like, course, there's exceptions, right? Like, like we know this, but like, I think this place could go a long way to, it could do with a bit more like class consciousness, right? Oh, totally. Totally. And you didn't have, um, you know, organizations like CLAC going in and poaching workers from other unions that are already unionized and then just, you know, giving them crap contracts and stuff. I've never heard of that. That doesn't surprise me. Oh, I, there was a big thing about it last year. I did a couple of articles on it. It was CLAC and another union. I can't remember which one it was. Yeah. Building Trades Alberta issued some public statements. And actually, I think the Canadian Building Trades got involved as well, issuing a bunch of statements and stuff regarding it because it was just, they were going in and poaching all these workers from different unionized job sites and stuff, and then driving down wages and reducing benefits and all this kind of stuff just so they can, you know, ratify contracts and whatever else, appease the employers. Like we, we were all around, all around like those last couple decades, right? We've all watched worker protect rights and protections like just get whittled away there are trillion dollar industries in like weakening union positions right like through yep. union busing and like like you said like clock like just straight up hiring from them like offering more quote-unquote lucrative contracts and then just pulling the rug out from under them like we watched this happen with uber and the fucking cabs here like when Ooh. uber first came into town like they they had the best rates and at the time, this was before I was a little more radicalized. I had, I was just like, why are the cabbies upset, right? Yeah. So why don't they just fix their rates? But it's like, there's a reason, like, they relied on their their unions to protect them. And then Uber didn't have to deal with that. They had all this startup row money that they could use. So they were operating at a loss for a bit. And then now that they are the top dog in town, where like, the rates are, are worse, right? <laughs> yeah. And they don't have to pay, you know, deductions or income tax or anything like that. It's ridiculous. And it's not just them. It's like DoorDash and. Yeah. All that gig economy shit. Like I recognize that being a subcontractor, like I'm maybe a half a step removed from that. Right. Like it is a position with zero freaking worker like protections. Yeah. The, my first job when I was married was as a courier in downtown Vancouver and they considered all the couriers to be um, contractors. Oh my God. You couldn't have a contract with another courier service. You had, you had an exclusive contract with them, but they always considered you to be contracted. So they didn't have any deductions or anything like that. These, these are companies that have been around for several decades, you know, they weren't startup companies or whatever. And so you're not paid by the hour, you're paid per delivery. So it just depends on what deliveries you are. And so sometimes they'd hire too many couriers and so they wouldn't have enough jobs to go around or, oh, it was just, it was, it was so ridiculous. And I didn't have a bike. And so I was on my feet. I have an osteoarthritis and it was just starting to manifest in my ankles. And so my feet were just killing me at the end of the day, all for, Awful. when you averaged it out, I was making $13,000 a year with that job. 
And this was like almost 30 years ago. Oh my God. Yeah. It was it was so bad. Oh my God, dude. <laughs> yeah. And so it's the same thing. Like it's it's just basically this whole gig economy, even though it wasn't technically a gig economy, it was the same attitudes. And truck drivers are the same way as well. A lot of the times the truck drivers are considered to be contractors and not paid employees. And yeah, just the whole thing is just ridiculous. They're just trying to take advantage of the workers in any way that they can. Yes. And then all <laughs> they're trying to shuffle costs a bit, like operating costs and all that down to the freaking worker, right? Like these gig drivers got to pay their own gas and insurance and all that fun stuff. Yeah. And they have to, you know, provide the bottled water and all that kind of stuff for the customers. So they get great reviews and they want great reviews because that affects, you know, their ability to get rides and how much they get paid and all that kind of stuff too. So the company is forcing this on them. And it becomes more about the reviews than about the trip, right? <laughs> like we know where all this goes. There's not much more to it. Like I worked in service for a couple of years and I eventually broke out because like the, the, the company that I'd been with, I was laid off from because they actually shut down operations in Edmonton because it wasn't as lucrative for them as Calgary because the, the housing markets are a little different, right? You can negotiate a better like return on your investment in Calgary than you can in Edmonton right now. You get there, the profit margins are wider and it's booming out there. Right? And so they didn't want to play within Edmonton's rules and they just, which was pathetic because like, honest to God, we had the best team in the city. Like we, we had guys who came from big companies, like competing companies. And so they knew the lit, like those teams that we were competing with and we had the best in the city because they wanted to play according to Calgary rules. Right. They wanted to, from the top down, impose, like run the company the exact way it's running Calgary. They wanted to run it that way here. Yeah. It didn't work out. And then our operations manager was butting heads with the owners. Right. And that's what it came down to, like who had the more percentage. Right. And they just shut us down. All those workers and their families lose that source of income just like that. Yeah. What do they care? Right. Yeah. Totally. I just kind of like was disillusioned with working for all these big companies just been doing my own thing because like this way I set my own hours yeah I can say no to a job every now and then but like there's still that you know like I don't want to be out in the street <laughs> yeah you know for the longest time I used to think you know having a, a job where you're employed by somebody else it's job security and then I got laid off twice in a three-year period and I said you know what oh my god it's no more job security than working for myself so I said I'm just gonna go out on my own and so that's what I've been doing ever since it's been like the last 14 years this Either this month or last month this marks 14 years since I've been on my own. So wow. Yeah. Well, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I mean it's had its up and downs. I've had some really good years and I've had some not so good years. So <laughs> sure. Like like they tell you that hard work alone will bring you success, right? Like that that was the thing that was drilled into us as kids. But at one point when I was cooking, this was let's see, when I first come back from Calgary. I was at Tony Roma's at West Edmonton Mall. I was supervising at that location. I had, was helping cook across Bourbon Street at first round. So I was working two cooking jobs at the same time. I was supervising at one, and then I would get off and then walk across to Bourbon Street and start my shift at the other job. And then I had a third job. It was like a cleaning business. Every now and then throughout the week, we would clean carpets, clean people's houses to move out. One time we cleaned like a hangar. Really? At one point, I was cooking at two fucking jobs. And then after that, I would go and we would have a restaurant contract, like a midnight janitorial contract. So after those two jobs, I would go and freaking clean up a third restaurant. And like, I got nothing to show for that, right? Yeah. Totally. All that time doing that. And like, all I came out of it was an alcohol addiction. You know what I mean? Like, they don't care about the work that you put in. Like I, I well, the technically was my first job. My first job when we moved to Lethbridge was working for a gas station. But after my first paycheck was like less than $200, I was like, okay, this isn't going to work. <laughs> and uh, the second job I got was carpet cleaning. Yeah. There were some times with like, we'd have to do a restaurant or a, a pub or something at two o'clock in the morning. It's like, oh my goodness. I hated it. When do you sleep, right? I know. You're not allowed to miss those. <laughs> yeah. And then this is the funny thing too, is like, oh my goodness. My boss wouldn't pay me for driving time. If we went out to, you know, Sterling or Tabor or some of the other communities, I wouldn't get driving time. One time we drove to, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, you know, distances in Southern Alberta, but we had a job in Medicine Hat. So we drove all the way to Medicine Hat, did a job, came back. And that's like between an hour, an hour and a half, one way. 
and he gave me half an hour driving time. Fuck off. Like I can't do anything for that three hours that we're in the vehicle. Like I can't just like I can't play on my phone because I mean, but this is back in the uh, late nineties. We didn't have stuff like that anyhow. You know, I can't be chatting on the phone or talking to friends or watching TV or anything like that. I can't do anything but be in the company vehicle with you the whole time. Uh, yeah, I get that the job's not paying you for your driving time, but that's that's on you. Like negotiate that, man. That's t- that as far as I'm good. That's time committed. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. Totally. He wouldn't pay me extras on holidays either. Oh, fuck, man. Yeah. Fuck. I ended up getting some arthritic pain in my hip. And so the way that we were cleaning carpets, uh, there's a lot of hip movement. And so I ended up quitting, gave them a two-week notice. My last day was supposed to be the um, the August holiday, Heritage Day, I think they call it here. And they wanted me to come in to work my, that last day. And so I told them, okay, well, are you going to pay me holiday pay? Because technically you're supposed to be paying me holiday pay. And they said, no, it's like, well, then I'm not coming in. (laughs) (laughs) That was the first time I've ever stood up to a boss like that. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I hated the job. I really did. I didn't want to go in. And that was the only way I could figure out to to get out of it. It's sad that like you, we have to be like, at your wit's end before your it's there's any like justification for like standing your ground or whatever the hell right yeah totally like it's time committed outside of regular time scheduled so like where's the compensation for any of this exactly or do you expect people to just be on call their whole time like their whole lives right like yeah please. So that's what happens sometimes like sometimes we wouldn't have any uh any jobs for the day so um i'd phone in hey hey are we where do you need me to be or whatever and he said well we don't have any job scheduled i was like okay and then at like two o'clock in the afternoon hey we got a job i was like okay so you want me to come i guess like, <laughs> what am i supposed to do just sit around like, oh, that's uh, awful. yeah there's a reason so many people are constantly unemployed and or like curtain for jobs these business people can use that to leverage shittier wages for everyone right they're like if you don't want it someone will take it and so there is that incentive to keep a bunch of people fucking poor and struggling all the time we know it's cheaper to literally just like feed and house and clothe people than just whatever the hell we're doing now exactly that's why alberta hasn't had a low unemployment rate in years below 5%. A high unemployment rate means that there are more people desperate to get a job. You know, a low unemployment rate benefits the workers, right? Because there are fewer people who are trying to apply for those jobs. And so the employers are going to be a little bit more accommodating. If they have a high pool of applicants to choose from, then they're going to be less accommodating. They're less likely to give you wage increases. They're less likely to improve your working conditions. They don't have to. Yeah, exactly. They don't have to say, well, if you don't like it, they go work somewhere else. We'll just, we got this pile of a hundred people who want to work here and take your place. Yep. And these are things I've heard constantly in my time in, in kitchens and in like on construction crews, right? There's always another fucking like, oh, we'll just, <laughs> we'll go and hire like a fucking someone brown, right? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck. Awful. So you mentioned you have a brother. Yeah. What's your brother do? He is a bartender, right? Or no, he's a bar manager. Sorry. That's, that's oh, okay. Recent. Cool. Yeah. I remember uh, when I was a teenager, I always wanted to be a bartender after I saw the movie cocktail. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but it's an old no. movie now, but it has Tom Cruise in it. He's the main character and mm. he's this fancy bartender and stuff. And he made it look very glamorous. For sure. I, I'm, I'm sure that's part of what drew my brother into it. Like, uh, <laughs> I was like back in the day when I was working at 20 Romas and at West Ed, I, I got him a job there, rent a house because I didn't want him in the back. Like even then I knew that like he wouldn't like the back of house as much, right? Rent a house you get to, it's a little more social. It, it was more his wheelhouse, right? And that's basically the kind of thing he's been doing since mostly bartending. Okay. Yeah, it's in the hospitality sector still. Yeah. That's pretty He cool. just moved out recently. So it's it's working out for him, I think. Younger brother? Yep. Uh, three years younger. Okay. And what's your mom doing now? My mom works as an accountant for H&R Block. Oh, wow. Okay. She was growing up, like the way she put food on the table, she was a civil engineer. Not quite. Like she would do the drafting for them, like through AutoCAD and all that. Oh, wow. And so like she did work on our Anthony Henday Highway, right? That's the really? thing highway in Edmonton that circles the city. She did work on that. She did work on some highways out like towards the mountains. I guess she was a pretty big shot for what she was at the time. 
Wow, for someone cool. who didn't even speak the freaking language, right? Yeah, her, yeah. her name landed on the, I guess the credits. I don't, I don't know the <laughs> terminology for that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. And then she was laid off. <laughs> Shocker. Right. A, a Calgary company bought the Edmonton location and laid everyone off. And she was just like, "Well, I got all this free time now. I guess I'll go to school." I was my mom about my mom is she's always loved school. She loves learning. I think that was an opportunity that wasn't really afforded to her being like a primary, being made a primary house, like caretaker at like eight for a extended family, <laughs> like a big household. But uh, she's a, an accountant now cool. for H&R Block. She does some taxes for people on the side. <laughs> and so that leaves you where you are right now. Yeah. All right. So a question I ask all of my guests, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, but maybe you have a few more thoughts on it, is how has your intersections of marginalization ever influenced your experiences as a worker? What I mean by that is how your ethnicity or religion or sexuality or gender or level of ability or anything like that, how has that played into how your fellow workers or your bosses have treated you in the workplace? The short answer is to me personally, if I was a totally selfish individual, not so much. The, the actual answer is like, okay, I'm Asian, right? So if you're aware of this concept of a model minority, yeah, like it's very easy for me to like integrate, right? Get the jokes and the, and the whatnot. And I work hard, right? I'm okay what I do. So it's like, you don't get to make fun of me. There's not really any low hanging fruit that way. But what that means is that I get to hear what these people say about everyone else right and that's what i was saying earlier about like i'm a cis man right anyone who else who didn't fit that category i got to hear it at one point we had a trans man sign up and he he really tried his hardest and like he literally was just like he was the hardest worker like this was when i was working service and drywall right and this guy was the hardest worker who had ever come in through those fucking doors but he couldn't hack it because he was literally like four feet eight or something or like um, five feet he was it was literally like he was just if he was just like a foot taller he would have put us all to shame kind of deal right right yeah that that bit was forgotten about after he left people would just like trash him for fucking weeks after like months yeah. after there was a guy who like a couple years after would from i'm like dude <laughs> But that guy was very chudly. But I've heard and seen like the way straight white men talk about people that aren't. I got to see and hear the worst of it, right? It never made me feel like, oh, I'm glad they're not talking about me. Maybe they are, though. You know, yeah, that's just it, right? Like, <laughs> if someone's always talking shit about everyone else, well, then they're probably talking shit about you too, right? Yeah, when you're not there or whatever. Exactly. But I got to see the callousness that is out there for people who are different not just different, but like who don't perfectly met, meet this ideal that can't, can't even exist, that doesn't exist, that never existed and is being sold to them <laughs> for a reason, right? Yeah, no, I totally get it. Like not only am I a cis guy as well, but I'm also a white guy. So um, I've heard all sorts of things about all sorts of people. So when people think that you're safe, <laughs> you start speaking up against people, then they start uh, ostracizing you and just- um... You're marked, you're, you're a traitor now. Yeah, not including you in things and all that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, any final thoughts for our listeners? Um, can I get like political and topical? <laughs> sure. Just keep in mind, this probably won't go out for another month or two. That's fine. Free Palestine. That's it. Okay, that's <laughs> awesome. That might still be topical when this comes out. Yeah, odds are good. Deadly. <laughs> yeah, free Palestine indeed. Is there anywhere people can go to you learn more about you and your work if you have social medias or a website or anything like that? Um, I am not a special guy. I keep to myself. Okay. Every now and then I'm on Kim's Facebook page doing my best. <laughs> Old man shaking his fist at the clouds impression. <laughs> uh, other than that, yeah. Okay. That's cool. If people are interested in following the Alberta Worker, you can find us online on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Of course, on YouTube as well. You can follow us at thealbertaworker.ca. And while you're there, sign up for our newsletter, either daily, weekly, or monthly. We can get a summary of the Alberta Worker news stories delivered straight to your email address. 
If you like this podcast, please rate it and leave a review on your favorite podcast listening app. We uh, depend on support of valuable listeners like you. So if you have the financial ability, please go to albertaworker.ca slash support to provide some support to the Alberta Worker. If you're interested in being a guest, you can either email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca or send us a DM on our social media accounts. Thanks so much, Norman, for joining us. Thank you to all the listeners for joining in. And as always, solidarity. Solidarity forever.